Welcome back to Get in the Mecca, and in today's episode, we are back talking about the end of Evangelion, and we are now on the second part of our end of Evangelion episode 100 special. Full disclosure, I just want to say this before we start the episode. This is the third time me recording this episode, and that's why it's quite late. I tried twice yesterday, and it it works, but for one of them, and I did tweet it, that I, I spent 15 minutes talking and I didn't actually turn on my mic or it wasn't registered in OBS, which was completely my fault, and so I started again. But by the time I started again, I was much more flustered and it just wasn't a good podcast at all. I looked awful, I was rushing, nothing was really going very well. And so let's just start fresh today. Uh, you guys won't really notice anything, but I'm in a much better mood and we can talk really um, extensively about this film. So here's the episode for this week and episode 100. I need to be very happy. <laughs> I'll talk about it more at the end, but um, episode 100 of Gen the Mecca, part two, a look at the end of Evangelion's second act. Last time when we did talk about the end of Evangelion, I stopped off where we spoke quite a lot about the imagery, uh, the violent imagery of EOE alongside stuff like the underlying metaphors. I spoke quite excessively about the army and how that mirrors humans and the very brutal nature of humans in the way in which they connect through violence. Speaking of violence, we also spoke about the Midsole Iso cut, the very famous set of cuts from a legendary animator in all honesty and we also spoke about how dark this movie kind of is the forced calm and chaos and all these other ideas this week we're going to try and talk about the second half as well as some elements that I really didn't manage to cover one of those mainly being music music is something that i think is super important in film of course and in this movie, <laughs> and I really want to get to the bottom, or I I'm not a music analyst, of course, I'm not going to try and talk music theory because I know very little about music theory, but I want to try and at least get to the bottom as to uh, what makes these songs quite interesting for our viewing experience, or listening experience, you could say. I'm also going to touch on some imagery stuff, as always. Um, I'm going to try and give a bit of a different take when it comes to the imagery stuff. And then finally, the ending. The ending, the uh, one of the most iconic scenes, maybe in the space of anime, but definitely in Evangelion. And I want to talk about why, or what I read from that, and why I think it's quite important in a very hard spot. Sorry, a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> Just going to go through a few things that I said last week, not about the actual anime, but just the conditions for this podcast. Firstly, if you are listening to this, there will be spoilers for the end of Evangelion. It's quite obvious, you should know that. And secondly, I'm not going to be able to cover every moment in the second act. I'm sure you're aware of that too. A lot happens, it's very busy, but I'm going to try and nail down the main moments and the main things and elements that stand out to me, and hopefully that will cover the gaps that I do leave in the narrative side of things. Probably the first thing that I thought about when analyzing this part or re-watching this part of the end of Evangelion was the imagery, and I know you're probably thinking, here someone goes again about Christian religious imagery, but, but no, I'm actually going to try and give a bit of a different take beyond just talking about uh, does it mean something versus does it not. Often there is this death of the author argument that yeah, it means something versus other people that say, but Arno said this, and that's a very tired debate that I'm not really willing to go down, but I want to still talk about imagery even though it is a bit contentious perhaps in the wider scheme of Evangelion discourse. I can only think of one anime <laughs> that I've ever watched that I think just about does this, and it kind of does but it kind of doesn't, and that is the film Children of the Sea, which I do recommend, I actually quite liked that movie. 
But what it is, and it happens towards the ending of Children of the Sea as well, is that a lot of the imagery feels like it goes beyond any level of human abstraction or any level of human understanding and beauty. It's so complex and sublime to the point to which, or at least I feel like that's what it's trying to create rather than it literally is that. Obviously, I wouldn't really be able to talk about it if it was beyond my understanding of beauty in any capacity. But what I mean by it is that I think it's it's so it's made to be that that it's not so easy to grasp it's beyond again any understanding of human beauty there is very often this discussion about getting evangelion and trying to quote unquote explain it because it isn't an easy series to grasp i 100 percent understand that and i hold my hands up high I am partially the problem in de trying to decode Evangelion. I, I don't try to frame it like that because that's never really the intention of this podcast. I'm here to understand it and talk about it from my point of view, but I'm not really trying to explain it to you and say this is how it works, this is what it means. However, I think obviously the analysis of art wouldn't really exist if we didn't do this if we didn't analyze and attempt to decode it for ourselves and attempt to get to grips with it much better. However, I still think that there's this weird obsession with trying to get Evangelion to the point to which it kind of takes away potentially from what it builds, which is this very absurd imagery that isn't really supposed to be completely understood and grasped because it's beyond us, or it's beyond the characters in the movie. Something we've kind of touched on when talking about the absurdist ideas that underpin even Galeon, this notion that the characters live in this infinitely complex world and they attempt to understand it is the human search for reason and understanding to understand why they exist that is what almost all the characters try to do throughout this thing but we learn that that isn't really the case and it becomes incredibly clear in the imagery of the third impact where we see this massive ray and massive karu um, we see so many other crazy things that i don't think fully need to be well i think it's more so that you, you can have interpretations of it that's not what this podcast is about and saying you're not allowed to interpret it but i think part of the beauty is knowing that this is something that even the characters don't understand it is beyond their understanding of anything they've ever seen to be honest and that's where the the sheer shock of the end of Evangelion comes from particularly for Shinji seeing what feels like a nightmare in all honesty this is beyond dreams this is beyond reality this is something completely new. I think when I first watched the end of Evangelion I was almost the complete opposite. I was attempting to really try and get it and get why is this thing happening? Why does this look like this? But I think that isn't exactly the point or more so that I don't think you have to go out of your way to get it because I, I think you will end up being in the same position of the characters as well. You, the characters are insanely confused and perplexed as to what is going on. And if you really want to experience that almost nightmarish feeling that the third impact brings, you really just have to sit down and absorb it for what it is, which is this absurd nightmare. Even Gelion shows humans not being able to grasp everything, not being able to grasp the nature of human connection and get everything. They're not able to crack the code of reality. And it's the same with us. And that I think is the real filmmaking, arguably genius of the third impact. It's really weird, to be honest, and I, I give my hat off, obviously, to Arno Suramaki and everyone who had boards on this part of the movie. Uh, being able to create something that is perhaps beyond our reach and beyond the viewer's reach, I, it does not sound easy to make because ultimately you're a person who, this isn't me trying to say that there was no reasoning behind, uh, I'm sure there was a thought process behind Arno and Co's thinking, that, that's, <laughs> that's out of the question, of course there was, but I think making and generating something that goes beyond anything in which we can truly understand to the full extent sounds so hard to create, and hence I, I, give, I take my hat off to him. With that being said, even though the imagery in the second half of EOE, particularly in the third impact, is pretty hard to 
perhaps grapple with and relate to maybe i don't know if relate is the best term but it is still very harsh and disturbing nonetheless of course the giant ray and code who going across the world and also probably the most terrifying part of the movie being seeing everyone quite literally come to their deaths and almost self-destruct in this uh, they almost burst into human soup and it's really <laughs> that for the first time even upon the second watch which i watched on tv instead of uh, on my laptop that was still pretty that was something else and i don't know if i want to experience that again i you should definitely be aware of that before going into the end of evangelion because if you don't then you're going to be into a, in, in a shock quite literally but to be honest, that is kind of the experience of this movie. Experiencing it for the first time is something you'll probably never see coming. And you put yourself in the position of Shinji, uh, in the position of Asuka, in the position of, of everyone else, simply not knowing what is coming. And that is, the, that is also something I think that's quite genius about EOE. We're all kind of in a very similar, unsure state. And the viewers have to go through that same sort of dread <laughs> as much as those at Nerve do. I think challenging is a really great word for defining this second half. It's a challenging piece of media to really digest. And I think to engage with it as best as possible, we kind of have to humble ourselves and acknowledge that things, not all things should and can be completely understood. Some things are simply beyond us and that again, that doesn't nullify the analysis of the end of Evangelion. I'm doing it right now, but as a first time viewer, I I tried the opposite, but it got me nowhere. <laughs> and here I really am feeling a bit stupid, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's all become a bit full circle, and I've allowed it to play out, and probably enjoyed it much more. And really understood the dread and horror that comes with this movie and because that's kind of what i think the point is let's move things a bit forward we're still sticking to this notion of reality and also dreams but i want to talk a bit about one of my favorite perhaps moments and quotes and ideas in this movie one of my favorite parts is when we enter the quote-unquote real world where we um, we come in contact with real-life photography and video footage in the space of an animated movie. Uh, and they're not really combined together. They're quite literally, it's about, I don't know, five minutes or if not more of genuine <laughs> real-life footage. There's no like mixture. It's not a bricolage or anything like that. The idea of reality, when I really think about it, seems really hard to represent in on screen and particularly in an animated film because when you think of it, what really is reality? Is reality our reality? Is it theirs? Is it somewhere in between? And I, I do admire the decision to go to our world, mostly or quote unquote our world, because I think to this really breaks the rift between fiction and non-fiction, dreams and reality, film and the audience and so on. To explore the concept to the fullest, I do believe that it would be best or I, I, I'm agreeing with the decision. I, I think it's really great how you have to present it as a singular whole as opposed to simply the reality in Evangelion or the dream world in Evangelion. In the case of reality, Arno presents the reality of us as the reality as the dream world of Shinji. And we can argue that fiction is a dream world for us and reality for them. And so to break that, we have to converge the two together. I, I think if you're to present reality and if this commentary has to be, if, if Evangelion really is a commentary beyond just the, the realm of fiction, we have to bring it into ours as well. It's a universal concept and not just one that remains stagnant in the world of Evangelion. This leads me to perhaps my favorite quote in the film and maybe in anime. And it's when Rei and Shinji are having a brief discussion after all the craziness of the third impact, or it's kind of still within it, but <laughs> when they have that conversation and, it's, and it goes like this, then where are my dreams beyond where reality lies? 
then where is my reality where dreams end and that was that was a really big moment for me upon the second watch mostly because on the first watch i didn't notice it at all i <laughs> i think because i was so absorbed in the shock and scariness maybe of the movie the these quite hopeful or just very introspective quotes just didn't stick out to me very much which i'm kind of ashamed of to be honest now because uh, that was a really big opportunity that was missed enough on reality and dreams and all these weird concepts let's talk about something that's easier to grasp music and of course because this is youtube or just listening on podcast apps there isn't going to be any music but i'm going to talk about music because apparently you guys actually like listening to me talk about music every time i've done an analysis of an op which would be much easier to do actually when i think of it on youtube now but uh, I'm definitely going to try and do that sometime. Uh, but every time I've done an OP analysis, I actually get a lot of lists. So that might be something I'm going to try in the future. Anyway, music is also in this anime very stunning. And the mix of lyrical and non-lyrical tracks is something to really get excited about. Not just because it sounds great, but also it gives us a really great insight into what the characters are feeling in those current moments. Of course, this score is done by the Shiro Sagisu. Uh, I, I'm, again, I'm not a music analyst, I'm not a music expert, I don't know about music theory, so I'm not going to try and break it down. I just, I'm just going to say it sounds great. Of course, we have non-lyrical tracks like Expansion Blockade, and we also have lyrical stuff as well like everything you've ever dreamed and the iconic com susa todd let's start with the lyrical stuff first and i feel like it does two things it depends on the moment but sometimes it gives us a really great insight into what is happening and the thought process of said person or quite literally explains what is happening then however there are, there's also the opposite as well where sometimes it kind of gives this antagonistic reading or op oppositional reading as to what is going on where it will say this is what you're feeling right now when uh, something that's perhaps important to note about the end of Evangelion is kind of coming back from that bad state and continuing to live as Shinji does and so it's kind of like it's forcing a negative message on him which I think is the point it's kind of like it's a pro instrumentality song in a way not really but it feels more so that it's trying to almost root against the protagonist which is quite funny the famous lyrics of Combs is a Todd everything comes tumbling down as well as my world is ending and I wish that I could turn back time don't only talk about the degree of destruction in the very current moment but it makes it a very personal experience by obviously terms like my world is ending and I wish that I could turn back time it's it it takes us almost into the mind of someone like Shinji or Asuka where these psychological walls are very confused and their internal worlds are pretty much collapsing because their entire concept of reality is changing right before their eyes. And obviously when you see people dying left, right and center, it, it's not it's not easy. And I completely understand is that that is probably what is taking place inside their heads at that very moment in time. And Koms is a Todd pretty much just explains that for us without having to actually have someone like Shinji or Asuka narrate that. The world is collapsing but their internal world and their psychological worlds <laughs> or their psychological walls are collapsing simultaneously. Then we move on to another song which I really like and maybe I like it a bit more than Koms is a Todd that is everything you've ever dreamed which honestly feels like a call out more than anything. This was the song that I meant has a bit of an opposition or antagonistic feeling to it in the way that it talks about almost everything we don't want like this severed relationship between this girl that it mentions all these terms or quotes like hide behind a painted smile and you feel like life has no other reason to be or i said that a bit wrong sorry you feel life has no other reason to be that that's the lyric and i love how this connects to part one and how you have these motherly figures that we're becoming detached from and everything not just for shinji and eva one obviously asuka ritsuko and so on 
What I also find incredibly sus about this song, and I just realized it live right now when I'm recording this, is how it's called Everything You've Ever Dreamed, but it tells you everything that you kind of don't want. It It's masked as a pleasant thing on everything you've wanted, or to be fair, it's, you could argue it's even quite sarcastic in the way that everything you've ever dreamed to be fully connected with people, but then you realize that it's all a guys or it's all it's not it's very superficial we might be fully connected but we don't live with the trials and tribulations of life and so i love that again that dynamic between the song title and the actual lyrics itself are that's really crazy when i think of it to be honest and, and that's really smart titling as much as it is a great like songwriting to be fair the non-lyrical stuff, however, is has a different tone to it. I think it actually sounds more hopeful <laughs> uh, overall. There are some, obviously, it's even Evangelion, what do you expect? There are some pretty dun-dun-dun-dun, pretty dark tracks or very chaotic ones. And also Shirasaki being a lover of having these like orchestral vocals or uh, having choirs, that's the term. Uh, to underpin a lot of their tracks you get that obviously in stuff like SSS's Gridman and Dino Zenon you also get that in Bleach as well they really love doing that they, <laughs> they love the choir because it, it to be fair it sounds very almost enigmatic and holy but also kind of disturbing in a lot of ways when you have quite literally the world is ending and you're having a choir sing <laughs> underneath the track or over the track uh, I can understand why you'd be quite scared. The one that always comes to mind as of late is Expansion of Blockade, which accompanies Shinji's realization of the fact that he, he can continue to exist even if everything around him perhaps is torn to shreds or uh, he can't fully connect with the people that he so-called loves, like his mother, like his father, and so on. Another song which I really like is Jesus Bleibe meine Freude. I, I don't speak German, apologies if I did pronounce that wrong, but that also has a very great introspective, beautiful vibe to it, as if we enter the real world or what we view to be the real, the dream world almost. I don't have too much to say on it musically besides I love the moment it accompanies being us entering the so-called dream world or perhaps our real world, whatever you want to interpret it as. It really just comes at a nice time and I love how a quite introspective song is used rather than something that perhaps almost passes judgment on reality or dreams. They are simply whatever you want them to be, not a, an innately negative thing or an innately positive thing. And so we're kind of forced to just absorb it and take it in for what it is. And a great song like Meine Freude does exactly that. Finally, let's talk about the very ending, the famous final moments of the movie in which Asuka and Shinji are on what seems to be a beach and Shinji is strangling her I guess and Oscar is touching him on the arm and so I've been requested to give my interpretation on this um for for quite a while and I I should have done it sooner to be honest but episode 100 is a nice place to do it anyway <laughs> so let, so let's talk about this to me it's really a return to where everything began oh. and more so metaphorically re regarding the hedgehog dilemma it's a return to the same fundamental problem in which we struggle to connect with each other but we wish to connect. Shinji strangling her and ultimately hurting her but still connecting with her through touch is kind of exactly what he struggled with from the start and that's what I would say is the tough pill to swallow. We have to continue what well, we're inevitably going to hurt each other. There isn't really an answer to this dilemma. It's a dilemma after all. <laughs> there isn't a right answer to this and so when we connect with each other we'll inevitably hurt each other at times and Shinji and this moment and this scene is that kind of in it as a physical representation in my view. Upon watching this for the first time, I didn't really pick up on something, and it's how the film kind of primes us into understanding how humans connect with one another when you see, or you don't really see it, but when you see Kaji and Misato kind of doing their thing, <laughs> um, we also see it through touch as well. 
through violence uh, as we see throughout this movie and throughout part one and part two this is kind of the same thing or it's in that similar vein in my uh, my very unsubstantiated opinion of what i feel like arno would in his head be saying is something like here's your much clearer visceral answer that you all wanted in my main series and it's kind of the same answer that there isn't a simple problem to this perhaps the quote-unquote first ending is much more optimistic you could say but i feel like this it kind of still is uh, but maybe as optimistic it reminds us that we still have to continue to struggle we have to continue to live we have to continue to be confused and and accept that we're confused in a very complex world that we can't crack the code to reality and and know how to connect to one another without the consequences of potentially hurting each other i wanted to avoid this term but if you wanted to maybe call it something you could call it a non-ending would I call it that? No, mostly because that kind of defeats the point. It, the The point is that there is no easy resolution. It's an eternal struggle that we have to learn to live with. And it, it kind of goes against the point by saying it didn't end. It, it, it did, but it just is continuous. So yeah, you could call it a non-ending if you want, but it's a really good one in that regard, maybe the best one I've seen. With that being said, I kind of want to correct some of my thinking from a few years ago and say that the end of Evangelion is much more hopeful now that I look back at it. And Evangelion as a whole, towards the end, is much more hopeful than what I first remembered. To kind of juxtapose what I said about part one, where I said that in order to create chaos, we need calm. And in order to create disorder, we need order. The end of Evangelion is kind of, well, the second part is almost the reverse of this. In order to create a beautiful sense of hope, we really need a, a place where hope feels scarce in film, I think, or in narrative in general. We have to understand what it's like to have little hope in order for the hope, by contrast, to feel hopeful honestly where there's this fleeting sense of we can actually do this we can actually save ourselves and save our own reality and and at least try to come to terms with it eoe presents us with what feels like the inevitable death of all life and uh, this almost implosion of reality through its violent imagery and destructive imagery but in order to come back from that and reject the force reality that is human instrumentality, kind of relating that whole thing on force connection and force calm, which we spoke about last week, it creates a sense of hope, honestly. The very violent nature of, end of, even, of the end of Evangelion, it, it, it puts up this really massive challenge where uh, a challenge maybe is not the best term but it's the only thing i can think of it creates this massive challenge where it, it's such a big thing to overcome and when we overcome it as shinji arguably does it feels that extra bit more rewarding this film and even Gellion gets a massive reputation for being a doomers movie uh, <laughs> something that i i have taken to at times and it's definitely something that, again, it's a challenging film, it's a challenging piece of media, no, no doubt about that. It can be extremely dark at times, but it's often depicted by many or some as a show about teenage depression or just a show about sad kids. I think this is a really good point to end on for this podcast and season as a whole where, where we've ended our main EVA 90s series analysis. In the process of saying all of this, I think that Evangelion has an aspirational message that many or some don't acknowledge a lot of the time, particularly the end of Evangelion. It's in there. You kind of just have to, I don't say find it, but you have to acknowledge that the inevitable struggle for getting to grips with reality is better than than being forced to connect with one another and that's that i think is ultimately quite hopeful <laughs> in a very twisted backwards way the end of evangelion has a semi hopeful message depending on which way you look at it as much as it has a harsh one but i think there's a beautiful takeaway in there
And with that being said, that is the final episode of this season and uh, the end of this podcast, really. Uh, thank you so much for your support for these 100 episodes. I know I've been saying it's season one, season one, season finale. I'm not going anywhere. There's not going to there's not going to be a planned break anyway. There's not like, I, I do intend to make a season two trailer and not, not for YouTube though, just for like the RSS feed. But besides that, we're just going to be moving on to episode 101. I just want to make this a bit of a special occasion, but thank you so much for listening to this podcast for however long you have. Uh, I still think we have a long, a long, <laughs> long way to go, but I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Okay, I'm not going to say every, that's a lie. But there there are moments where I have had tough points, but the podcast is always something to look forward to. And I've loved, what, what I will say I've loved every moment of is just talking about anime every week, just having the pleasure of delving into my own thoughts and sharing that with however many people is always a, a wonderful experience and I won't take that back for anything honestly despite all the perhaps recording disasters <laughs> and moments that have happened that maybe things didn't go at the best but it's still something that I'll never take back besides that I don't really I know I said I was gonna speak at the end I I don't really have a speech I'm gonna be podcasting next week so nothing much is going to really be different besides, you know, season two. So that that's cool, I guess. <laughs> um, so tune in next week, hopefully. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to be talking about. As always, I've been saying that since like episode 20 of this podcast, since I started recording like pretty much every single week rather than batch recording. I, I do want to get back into that though, but hopefully you will join me on the journey through season two and beyond in which we'll be talking about everything from Kizu Monogatari, the EOE rebuild, not EOE rebuild, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's what happens when you've been recording for a hundred episodes and you mess up your second part three times, but <laughs> um, rebuilds from Evangelion, I'm going to try and go through all those. More mecha anime, there are some anime I want to come back to, there are some which I want to introduce for the first time on this show. Now that we have video, we can also do some really cool things too and so many other things, whatever you request really, um, that, that I can actually do. But besides that, thank you for listening. And if you really want to support this podcast, because it, it has been a while, dip, it doesn't matter how long you've been listening, but if you really do want to support, then leaving a review, of course, an Apple podcast goes a really long way. There is a link in the description and I will read your review live on the show. You can literally watch me do it. I, I do it every time. You can ask me a question in that too. I, I also, sorry, on the, I know I'm like moving very back and forth between a lot of the topics, but I also want to do segments again. I'm going to try and give that a try because I kind of ditched them after a while. <laughs> uh, and, and I didn't say anything because I just didn't want to like ruin the flow of the show. But I do want to bring back segments. So that's something that I will try to do in some sort of capacity. But yeah, leave a review. That helps out. Um, like, subscribe on YouTube as well here. That really goes a long way, particularly if it's in the first hour too. Anyway, thank you for listening for to this podcast in general. <laughs> I have been your host Jamal today and I'll see you next week, hopefully on season two of Gen the Mecca. The music in this production goes as follows. Mandatory Overtime by Joth and Synthwave by Alex by Alex McCulloch.